stands up for an idea, acts to improve the lot of others, or spreads out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can create a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the next President of the United States, Robert food. And I, they, my uh, grandfather, my great-grandfather, Honey Fitz, was the first ghetto Irish mayor of Boston. His daughter, Rose Kennedy, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, was my grandmother. And she loved this country because she understood that this country, for the first time, had given her people the capacity and the opportunity participate in their own political destiny. And she loved every, she made her children take the Freedom Walk here in Boston. She took them to Walden Pond on weekends. She took them to Breeds Hill and Bunker Hill and the other major battles of the revolution. She wanted them to know their history and to love their country. She made all of us, all 29 of her grandchildren, memorize Longfellow's poem. So listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that fateful day and year. And Paul Revere took off 242, day, 242 years ago last night from the Old North Church in the North End where she was born, my grandmother was born, and he rode out to conquer, to run, to to alert the countryside, and particularly the Minutemen, that a British troop of 800 men was coming to confiscate their arsenal and their powder dump. And those men met the British Army, the largest and most powerful empire in history, on the Old North Bridge 242 years ago today. And they drove them back and they chased them in retreat through Concord, through Lexington, through Lincoln, through Arlington, into Cambridge, inflicting terrible casualties. 
And that was the beginning of the American Revolution, but really the revolution had started two years before. And it started when the British had passed an oppressive law raising the taxes on tea in New England. And they raised, this was a law that the British Crown made in collusion with the British East India Company, which the king owned shares in, his ministers owned shares in, and most of the aristocracy owned shares, shares in. And it was their plan to impose the tax on New England merchants, but exempt the British East India Company from the tax so that they could undersell everybody and that they would make a profit for their shareholders. So the revolution, and, the, and of course, the, the Americans responded by dressing as Wampanoag Indians and boarding the British East India Company's ships and dumping the tea into the harbor. And that's when the British sent that troop over here to quell the rebellion. So that rebellion was in part against empire. But the this, this spear tip of that rebellion was a fury that the, that the colonists had against the merger, the corrupt merger of state and corporate power. I, uh, um, I'm here today to announce my candidacy for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. <laughs> and my, my mission over the next 18 months of this campaign and over my, throughout my presidency will be to end the corrupt merger of state and corporate power that is threatening now. <laughs> that is threatening now to impose a new kind of corporate feudalism on our country to commoditize our children, our Purple Mountain's majesty, to poison our, our children and our people with, with chemicals and pharmaceutical drugs, to strip mine our assets, to hollow out the middle class and keep us in a constant state of war. Well, I want to start I first of all, I can't understand that sign language. <laughs> I want to start by, by, um, uh, by thanking my wife, Cheryl Hines. Um, I, would not, I would not be here without Cheryl. And um, I cannot describe in words what she has brought to my life, um, but uh, she is the wisest person that I know. She's also one of the funniest pe people I know. And I think when the American people get to know her, that they are going to be more excited about having a really funny first lady in the White House than they are. I also want to thank all my family members who showed up today. My children, uh, Bobby, Kick, Amaryllis, Connor, Kira, Finbar, Aiden. Did I leave any out? <laughs> I told them to wear name tags, and I can't see them from here. And, that, my, and cat, and a cat. So that's uh, uh, my. My grandchildren, Zoe and Cassius and, uh, and Bobcat, uh, my brother, Douglas, my sister, Courtney, uh, my nephews, Bo and uh, Billy Birdsell and, and uh, Riley and George and I... 
Anthony Shriver, I am so grateful for you coming here. And Gatto, I said Gatto. Okay, I'm very, very grateful to all of you for coming. There are other members of my family who are not here today. Oh, I'm going to make a confession because I know for most American families, they, they never have any differences with each other. Oh, oh when one does, it's... <laughs> so, when that happens in a family, it's really huge news, like everywhere. And, um... But, you know, I'm, I want to just say this. I'm very grateful that many of the families who disagree with what I'm doing today, many of the family members have taken the time to write me beautiful letters of love this week, to send me emails, to make telephone calls to me. And I, I bear no ill will or any kind of disappointment to any of them. They have different views of, of the politics in this country. My whole family, including myself, have long personal relationships with President Biden. Many of my family members are working in the administration. Uh, many of them also dis just plain disagree with me on issues like censorship, on war, on public health, and they are entitled to their beliefs, and I respect their opinions on them, and I love them back. And my hope... And is it too much to hope that we could have the same thing for our country? We have a polarization in this country today that is so toxic and so dangerous, and at any time since the Civil War. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln said, a country or a nation, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And when I talk to both Republican friends and Democratic friends, they talk about this division in almost apocalyptic terms. Nobody can see a safe way or a good way out of it. And people are preparing for a kind of a dystopian future. And um, part of the, one of the principal missions of my campaign and of my presidency is going to be to end that division. Yeah. And, and I'm going to try to do that by encouraging people to talk about the values that we have in common rather than the issues that keep us apart. And also, also, and this I think is the most important thing, I'm going to do that by telling the truth to the American people. Because that is the core, that is the core of this division, of course. When we fight each other, when blacks fight whites and Republicans fight Democrats and our rural fights are urban, the people, that merger of corporate power that sits at the top is loving the fighting between us, among us, so that they can strip mine our country. And the thing that keeps us... The reason truth is so important, when I was a little boy, nobody in this country would dream that our government would ever lie to the American people. In fact, and that's not a joke, nobody believed it back then. In May of 1960, that changed a little when Gary Powers crashes U-2 in Russia and the Eisenhower administration denied that we had a U-2 program because they didn't, they didn't know at the time the Russians had captured Gary Powers, and when, when the Russians produced them, it was a shock to the American people that their government had lied to them. 
And then in 1970, during the Vietnam War, of course, we all began to suspect that we were being lied to. And in 71, when the Pentagon Papers came out, we realized, oh, this is what they do. My father, just before he died, told me very sadly, people in authority lie. And the government now lies to us. We all know it. We take it for granted. When my uncle left office in 19... When he died in 1963, about uh, 80% of Americans said they trusted their government. Today, 22% uh, trust their government, and 22% trust the press, the lowest level ever. The media is at the lowest need because we know the media lies to us now, and everybody knows that. And the problem is... And, and, so, and the problem is that when the, 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 uh, when the sources of information that we're always used to and that we need to rely on in democracy, when they start lying to us, Americans look for other sources because they know they're being lied to and they look for other sources of the truth. And when the media and the, you know, the corporate captive media and the corporate captive government sees other sources of truth, they have to brand those misinformation because they threaten their paradigm. They threaten that orthodoxy. And, and of course, there is a lot of genuine misinformation. But as we know, a lot of the misinformation is just statements that depart from government orthodoxy. So they have to either censor us or they have to lie about what's true and what's not true. And that amplifies the polarization. It, it amplifies the hatred, the fear, the insecurity, because you know you're being lied to and then you're being silenced. The censorship doesn't work from any point of view, and it's very, very dangerous. My father, 55 years ago last month, I sat as a 14-year-old boy behind my father as he announced in the Senate caucus room in Washington, D.C., his campaign for presidency of the United States. And my father at that time was in the same, in many ways, in the same position that I'm in today. He was running against a president of his own party. He was running against a war. He was running against, a, he was running at a time of unprecedented polarization in our country. And he had no chance of winning. My father, when he declared, had not a single molecule in him that he believed that he could win the Democratic nomination. Why is that? He had run his brother's campaign in 1960, eight years before. But now, all the unions were against him, with two exceptions, the United Auto Workers and Cesar Chavez's United Farm Workers. The, the liberal press was 100% against them from the New York Times to the Village Voice. The labor union, the, uh, the big city mayors were against them, including Mayor Daley, who had played a critical role in President Kennedy's nomination. The, all of the people in the, the New Frontier, who were his closest friends, were now working for the Johnson White House, so they were against him. The only people that he had with him, even the universities were against him, because they were with McCarthy, the, the, the group of Hollywood, like Joanne Woodward, Paul Newman, who had been very close to him, very, worked very hard for my uncle in 60, uh, were now working for McCarthy. And my father in the universities, my father, my father used to say that, the, he, that McCarthy had all the A students and he had the B and C students. <laughs> and, um, and so the only people he had were People, uh, poor white people in rural areas like Appalachia, poor blacks and, uh, in the Delta and in our cities in Watts and Harlem and, uh, and East LA and Indians on the Indian reservations. And that was kind of it. But that hopelessness in his campaign freed him to tell the truth to the American people. So he went, when he went to Indiana University and the medical students said to him, who's going to pay for your health care program? He said, you are. 
And when he went to Creighton University in, which is a Catholic university in Omaha, and they asked him whether he would support their deferments, he said no. The deferments were the reason most of them were in college, because that was the only way you could get out of Vietnam. And he said no, and they booed him. And he said, do you think it's fair that 45% of paratroopers in Vietnam are black? Do you think it's fair that we are sending black children to fight this war? Because they can't get their, their kids into college. He said, I can get my 10 kids into college and get them out of the war if I want to. But do you think that that is consistent with your Catholic values at this university? And when he ended, they gave him a standing ovation. When he went to Watts and he talked about the importance to the black community of abiding with the law, they applauded him. When he went to the University of Alabama, which he had forcibly integrated by federalizing the National Guard with the United States troops five years before, he talked to them about the enduring importance of civil rights. They applauded him. When he went to the University of Kansas and gave a speech to 20,000 people and the kids in the auditorium who were all corn-fed, Midwestern, pro-military, pro-Vietnam, and he talked to them for an hour about his evolution on the, and, and the, the, uh, the, the, the progression of the Vietnam War. And at the end of that, the applause was so thunderous that Jack Newfield, who was one of those reporters who was with him at that time, said it felt like the roof was coming off of the auditorium. The students rushed the stage. They were throwing chairs. They just wanted to hear the truth. That's it. And the day he died, he won the, the, he won the California primary, the most urban state in this country, and the same day, the South Dakota primary, the most rural. He had succeeded in uniting America and building that bridge just by telling people the truth. I was with my dad when he died in Los Angeles, and we brought him back to uh, New York on uh, Vice President Humphrey's plane on US 2, and we waked him at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and then we brought him from Penn Station in New York to Union Station in Washington, D.C. Normally, that's a two and a half hour train ride. But it took us seven and a half hours because there were two million people on the tracks. And that I will never forget as a 14-year-old boy what I saw from the windows of that train that day. In all of the urban train stations in Trenton and Newark and Philadelphia and Baltimore, there were, they were crowded with black and white men singing the battle hymn of the Republic. In the countryside, there were white people in military uniforms. There were, there were blacks. There were uh, rabbis and priests. I remember in Delaware, there were seven nuns standing in the back of a yellow pickup truck, just waving handkerchiefs at us as we passed. We saw, um, I remember, a, uh, passing a Little League game where all of the kids on both sides, both teams, the coaches, and all the spectators in the stand were standing with their hands at their hearts in salute. Um, we saw Boy Scout troops saluting, military officers and personnel, hippies and tie-dyed t-shirts. It was people holding up babies, mothers holding up babies. Many of them had American flags. Many of them had signs that said, goodbye, Bobby, or pray for us, Bobby. And we got to Union Station in Washington, and President Johnson met us there. And we drove my father's body up past the mall in Washington. And three months earlier, 
My father had communicated with Martin Luther King, and they decided to partner with Marion Wright Edelman, who was one of my father's aides, to organize. They saw that the Vietnam War was destroying the war on poverty. It was sucking all the money, and Johnson essentially had to pull the plug on the war on poverty. And my father told Martin, the poor are never going to get rights in this country until they start politically participating. Let's do a, a poor people's campaign like we did two years before with the civil rights, or five years before with the civil rights campaign. Bring them all to Washington. So all of these men, thousands of men, were encamped in plastic shanties on the mall. And we drove up past them. Martin had died you know, a month or a month and a half earlier. Now my father was dead. And we drove up past them. They all came to the sidewalk. And they held their hats against their chests in a salute and bowed their heads as we took my father up the hill across the bridge to Arlington to bury him under a simple stone next to his brother. And four years later, I was studying here at college American history, and I came across demographic data that showed that most of those white people who had lined that train track and who had supported my father in the primary in 1968 Four years later, in 1972, they voted not for George McGovern, who was very closely aligned with my dad, but instead by, for George Wallace, who was an ardent segregationist, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. And it occurred to me then, and it struck me many times since, that every nation, like every uh, nation, like every individual, has a darker side and a lighter side, and that the easiest thing for a politician to do is to, is to appeal to our anger and our bigotry and our hatred and our greed and all the lower angels, the darker angels of our character. And that once in a while we get a political leader who tries to do successfully what my dad did, which is to talk to people in a way that gets them to transcend their narrow self-interest, gets them to transcend their fear and their bigotry and their anger and see themselves as part of a community, sees themselves as part of a, of a noble experiment and helps them to find the hero that we all have in each of us. And, and, and my father tried to persuade people that we have to avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor the brothers and sisters behind. Or that the only way we can get security is to get rid of our constitutional rights. And he tried to remind Americans that we each need to be a hero, and he succeeded in doing that. And his trail, unfortunately, was cut short. Um, when I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career and what brought me here. I started out, as Dennis mentioned, as I uh, spent 35 years as an environmental advocate. And at the beginning of my environmental career, yeah, end of 1983, the beginning of 1984, uh, a man who was a mentor of mine offered me a job doing high-level environmental policy in Washington or New York, or another job that was kind of uh, doing large purchases, purchases of, of conservation land. And I didn't want to do that kind of environmentalism. I wanted to be in the trenches, working with people, and in, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat against the big polluters, and I wanted to particularly work with people who were most harmed by environmental injury, but also were alienated or marginalized from the mainstream environmental community. My first case as an environmental lawyer was representing the NAACP in a lawsuit against Austin in New York for trying to put a waste transfer station in the oldest black neighborhood in the Hudson Valley. And I found out during that lawsuit 
that four out of every five toxic waste dumps in our country is in a black neighborhood. The highest, the, the largest toxic waste dump in this country is Emil, Alabama, which is 85% black. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in this country is the south side of Chicago. The most contaminated zip code in California is East LA. And black youth, probably the largest at that time problem with black youth, was that 48% of them had dangerous levels of lead in their blood. And that lead uh, reduced, dramatically reduced IQ and also causes severe behavioral problems. And I recognize, you know, I spent a lot of my time over the next 30 years fighting on those kind of issues. I spent summer vacation in jail in uh, maximum security prison in Puerto Rico in 2001 because I had successfully sued the Navy to stop bombing probably the poorest community in our country, the people, the black and brown people who live on the island of Vieques who are American citizens, uh, but they are not treated that way. But the other, the other group that I spent the rest of my time with, and the majority of my time, I wanted to work with rural Americans and working class Americans, who, and, and particularly hunters and fishermen, the hook and bullet people, who cared deeply as much as any other American about the environment, and yet they felt completely alienated from the mainstream environmental community. So I spent my career working for a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized on the Hudson River in 1966 to reclaim the river from its polluters. We have on the Hudson River the oldest commercial fishery in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. It's a traditional gear fishery. They use the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam and then passed down through the generations. One of the enclaves of the commercial fishery on the Hudson is a little village called Crotonville, New York. It's 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river. And the people who lived there in 1966 were not your prototypical, you know, mainstream environmentalists. They were affluent. They were not affluent. They were the opposite of that. They were carpenters, lathers, of factory workers, electricians, half the people in Grotenville made their living, or at least some part of it, fishing or grabbing the Hudson. These were people who had little expectation that they'd ever see Yellowstone or Yosemite or the national parks. They didn't have the money to take their families on those kind of vacations. For them, the environment was their backyard. It was the bathing beaches, the swimming holes, the fishing holes of the Hudson. Uh, that was their livelihood. It was their recreation. It was their food. Um, and Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the Riverkeeper user of the Fishermen's Association, used to say about the Hudson, it's our Riviera, it's our Monte Carlo. Richie Garrett was a grave digger from Wasserman, New York. He used to tell his new followers, I'll be the last to let you down. And, and uh, in my, <laughs> 1966, Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe in the Croton Harmon rail yard. And the oil went up the river on the tides and it blackened the beaches and it made the shad taste of diesel so they couldn't be sold in the Fulton Fish Market in New York City. And all the people in Grotenville came together in the only public building in the town, which was the American Legion Hall. This is a very patriotic community. Grotenville and the neighboring village of Austin had one of the highest enlistment and mortality rates during World War II and almost all of the original Riverkeeper board and officers and members were former Marines, they were combat veterans from World War II in Korea. Richie Garrett was a former Marine. These weren't radicals, they weren't militants. They were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. But that night they started talking about violence because they saw something that they thought they owned, which was the abundance of these fisheries and the, the purity and richness of the Hudson River's waters. And it was being robbed from them by large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they've been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution 
the Corps of Engineers, the Conservation Department, the Coast Guard, and they were given the bum's rush. Richie Garrett made more than a dozen separate visits to the Corps of Engineers office in Manhattan, begging the Corps colonel to do his job and shut down the Penn Central pipe. And the colonel finally told him in exasperation, these are important people. Speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors, we can't treat them that way. In other words, we can't force them to comply with the law. So these, this was classic agency capture. These agencies, these regulatory agencies, had become the sock puppets for the industry they were supposed to be regulating. And by this evening in March of 1966, 300 men and women came together in that American Legion Hall in Crotonville, and all of them had come to the conclusion that government was in cahoots with the polluters. And the only way they were going to reclaim the river for themselves is if they confronted the polluters directly. And somebody suggested they put a match to the oil slick coming out of the Penn Central pipe and burn it up. Somebody else said they should roll a mattress up and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own waste. Somebody else said they should float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, which at that time was killing a million fish a day on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. And then a guy stood up named Bob Boyle. He was a, a first lieutenant combat vet from Korea. He was also by then a world famous fly, fly fish, fisherman and spin fisherman. He was the outdoor editor of Sports Illustrated for 70 years. Two years earlier, he'd written an article about angling in the Hudson for Sports Illustrated. And in researching it, he had come across an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act. And that statute said it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught. But also there was a bounty provision that said anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And uh, he had checked it out with lawyers. The law had never been enforced in 80 years, but it was still on the books. And that evening he stood in front of this group and he said, uh, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that evening that they were going to... Go out and track down and prosecute every polluter in the Hudson. 18 months later, they shut down the Penn Central Pipe. He got to keep $2,000. There was a two weeks of wild celebration in the town. They used the money that was left over to go after Siva Geige, Tuck Tape, Standard Brand, American Cyanamid, the biggest corporation in America, and winning. In 1973, they collected the highest penalty in the United States history against a corporate polluter. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics at Hastings in New York. They used that money to build a boat. They hired a full-time riverkeeper, a former commercial fisherman, John Cronin. He, they hired me using bounty money as their attorney. And over the next couple of decades, we bought over 500 successful legal actions against Hudson River polluters. <laughs> Today, today, the Hudson River is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a river that caught fire. It, uh, it, was, it was dead for 20 mile stretches north of New York City, south of Albany. It turned colored depending on what color they were painting the GM tr trucks at Terrytown, the Terrytown, G uh, the Terrytown GM plant. Uh, today, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre. And more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean, north of the equator. And, the, la and the, the, the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of river keepers, water keepers. Now 350 of them in 46 countries were now the biggest water protection group in the world. But one of the... But, you know, the, the story of the Hudson also has a sad ending because General Electric Company dumped its PCBs into the Hudson to save money at its capacitator plant. And the PCBs, although they've spent a billion dollars trying to get them out, there's another three and a half billion that nobody's ever going to pay. 
Oh, the commercial fish are, many of the species are too toxic to eat, and it's the commercial fishery has been almost altogether closed. 2,000 families that I represented, now there's uh, probably two left. And those are families that enrich, it, enrich the history, the culture, the palate of New York uh, for three and a half centuries. And they're gone not because their business plan didn't work, because it did work for three and a half centuries. The thing that didn't work, free market capitalism worked perfectly for them. What didn't work was corporate crony capitalism. Was the General Electric Company <laughs> had better lobbyists. General Electric did not have a better business plan, it just had better lobbyists, so it was able to escape the discipline of the free market, corrupt public officials, dump its PCBs in the river, put, you know, my fishermen out of work, and everybody in the Hudson Valley now has General Electric's PCBs and their flesh and organs. Um, and that's, you know, that's, uh, that's what corporate crony capitalism does. Um, one of the things that I learned from the fishermen is that there's no daylight between environmental, good environmental policy and good economic policy. And, and you'll hear this mantra, this trope from the big polluters and their indentured servants in, on Capitol Hill and, you know, and elsewhere that we have to, uh, that uh, we have to choose between economic prosperity and environmental protection. And that's a false choice. In 100% of the situation, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. <laughs> If, if we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what the big polluters are urging us to do, which is to treat the planet as if it were business and liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, and we can make a few people billionaires by impoverishing the rest of us. But our children are going to pay for our joyride, and they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes, poor health, huge cleanup costs that are not going to amplify over time, and that they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cause of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. <laughs> And one of the things that I've done over the past 30 years as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront uh, this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure, the same as investing in telecommunications or road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and future generations. And by the way, you know, we're not protecting the environment just for the sake of the fish and the birds. We're protecting it for our own sake because those things, those things enrich us. They enrich us economically, spiritually, culturally, and all these other ways. Um, if, If we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries the public lands, those things that are not reducible to private property, but by their nature are the property of all of us, the commons, the commonwealth, the public trust assets, uh, the landscapes, the waterways that connect us to the 10,000 generations of human beings that lived before there were laptops, and that ultimately connect us to God. And, God, 
God. God talks to human beings through many factors, through each other, through organized religion, through the great books of those religions, through wise people, through art and music and uh, literature and poetry. But nowhere with such detail and grace and color and joy as through creation. And when we... When we, when we destroy a species, when we destroy a special place, we're diminishing our capacity to sense the divine, understand who God is, and what our own potential is as human beings. And Father, Father Martin once told me that the definition of sin is an injury to another human being or to God, to our relationship with God. And when we... You know, when we eliminate, my children are going to grow up in a world where they will never see the kind of explosions of color from butterflies that I saw every time I walked into my garden. Because 80 or 90 percent of the butterflies are gone, the flying insects. They'll never hear the songbirds that I heard because 80 percent of them are gone. They'll never see the amphibians, the, 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 the puddles that I saw as a boy, the bubbling like cauldrons with tadpoles from, you know, from salamanders and frogs. They're not going to see that in their lifetime. They're unaware of it. And it's like God is a tapestry and he's talking to us from all of these different vectors. And we're pulling threads out of that capacity. And it is such a crime against our children. And I think... I think... We deserve a president in this country who cares about these things and who talks about these things to the American people. So, I, I want to say, I want to say one other thing. That, you know, nature is the social safety net. When, when we had the Great Depression, 10,000 men who lost their jobs went down to the Hudson River to, to find oysters and blue crabs and sturgeon and shad and, and herring and alewives, and they fed themselves, their family, and some made money. And that was all nature is our social safety net. It's infrastructure. They can't do that if there's another depression. You know, we're relying on the government to give us money, but it's, uh, that's not reliable. Nature was always reliable. If you live in a sweltering home in New York you, and, and you, are, are a, you have no access to beaches, you can jump on the train and go right up to Croton Point Park and you can bathe in the river and get away from that for a day and experience nature and enrich yourself. You can't do that if the Hudson is polluted. My I have a couple of children of asthma. One out of every four black children now in urban areas has asthma. The asthma events are triggered by bad air days, by ozone and particulates. It's coming mainly from coal burning power plants. So those plants, General Electric Company privatized the fish in the Hudson River. They privatized the river to make profits for themselves through corruption. They, those coal generators are privatizing the air in my children's lungs. And we have to understand that it is an act of theft. Pollution is a subsidy and it's an act of theft. I want to move on to a, a, another issue that nobody's going to really want to talk about, but I need to. Listen. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm about halfway done with this speech. Oh. And, and this, is what, this is what happens when you censor somebody for 18 years. I got a lot to talk about. They shouldn't have shut me up that long. Because now I'm going to really let loose on them for the next 18 months. They're going to hear a lot from me. Uh, I'm going to talk about lockdowns. Um, and nobody wants to talk about it. I, but we need to understand, you know, I grew up 
at a time, most of my life was at a time that economists call the great prosperity. It's when the American middle class between 1945 and 75 grew to be the biggest economic engine in the, on the face of the globe. I mean, we were the economy in the globe. We made everything and everybody looked to us, not only for goods, but for moral leadership. And we became the most powerful country in the world, unrivaled. And it was because, and we had a stable democracy with institutions that people trusted, a press that told us the truth, and, um, and the destruction that, you know, everybody knows it's an economic and political economic rule. You cannot have democracy in a society where there is high concentrations of wealth and widespread poverty. You need a middle class or you don't get democracy. And uh, that, that is a law. That is a law. You cannot do it. That. You cannot do it unless you have a big middle class, and we had that. Uh, but since the early 1980s, there's been a systematic attack on our middle class, and the coup de grace was the lockdown. The lockdown was the biggest shift in wealth in human history, and I'm going to tell you about that in a second. And I blame President Trump for the lockdown. Now, a lot of people will say. A lot of people say, and President Trump gets blamed for a lot of things that he didn't do, and he gets blamed for some things that he did do. But the worst thing that he did to this country, to our civil rights, to our economy, to the middle class in this country, was a lockdown. Now, President Trump, in fairness, let me just make this point, will tell people, well, the lockdown wasn't my idea. It was my bureaucrats rolled me on it. I was saying we shouldn't do it, but that's not a good enough excuse. He was the President of the United States. He, and as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. On May 2nd, 2020, 600 doctors wrote, signed a letter to President Trump begging him not to do, allow the lockdowns. And they said because at, at that time, all of the pandemic protocols anywhere in the world, the WHO, CDC, everywhere, the European Health Agency, all says you never do mass lockdowns. It causes much worse havoc and deaths and injuries than if you do the standard protocol, which is you lock down the sick, you protect the vulnerable, and you let everybody else go back to work. Otherwise, you are going to wreak havoc. And of course, You know, and I wrote, I wrote about it for the, um, you know, on Instagram, I was writing every day. I was citing these economic studies that showed every point in unemployment you get, you get 37,000 excess deaths from heart attacks, suicides, you know, plus imprisonments. And I was writing about this. And they dumped me from the social. They said that's misinformation. But it was not. But people were saying it. People knew it. It wasn't just me. And we now know, of course, that it's true. There's now study after study and any, every comparison between the states and nations that locked down compared to those who didn't, you know, has shown the ones who locked down, the more you locked down, the worse you got. Worse COVID deaths, worse excess deaths. Sweden's numbers came out this week. Sweden was the only country in Europe that didn't lock down. It had the lowest excess deaths in Europe, which is very predictable. If the nation... You know, the nation that led lockdowns was us, and we had the highest body count of COVID on Earth. We have 4.2% of the world's population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. At some point, even the media is going to have to say, it. stop saying this was a success story. We... Oh. But, but the, the health issues were almost dwarfed by the economic ca cataclysm that befell our country. The, uh, the IMF and the Harvard study by Larry Summers says the cost of the lockdown to the United States was $16 trillion. $16 trillion for nothing. $16 trillion. We shifted $4 trillion from the middle class in this country to the super rich. 
we created 500 new billionaires. The existing billionaires increased their wealth according to the Oxfam study that came out three days ago by 30%. This was a gift to the rich. And guess what? The ones who were, the, the people who got richest were the social media companies like Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft that were conspiring with President Trump's White House to censor people like me. So the, the very people who were profiting on those lockdowns were the ones who were strip mining the wealth from the middle class in this country. Amazon got to close down all of its competitors. 3.3 million businesses it shut down. And I'm suing, I'm in a lawsuit involving Amazon for censoring one of my books. So they were censoring people who criticized the lockdowns while they were raking in the money from the lockdowns. And, and unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, President Trump, President Trump's White House was colluding with them. Um, uh, Forty-one percent of black businesses shut down, most of them permanently. I want to introduce you to somebody. This is Anthony Caldwell. Can you stand, Anthony? And if that, and just wave to people. <laughs> and Anthony Caldwell is from Boston. He was a chef, a very, very successful chef in this town for 19 years. He saved every, he and Yvette, saved every penny they had to to build their dream, which was that he would have his own restaurant by the time he was 50 years old. It was called 50 Kitchen. It was the hottest spot in Dorchester, which is the town that my grandfather and grandmother lived in. Um, the, they were turning away crowds. Boston Magazine called him a culinary genius. It was a mix of Asian fusion food with soul food. And then the lockdowns came. And Anthony told me the customers were gone he was looking out the window, staring out all day with, his, with the chair stacked in his, in, his, in his dining room and no customers. The federal government gave him $17,000, but they told him he had to spend it all within eight weeks or he had to pay it back. And he said to me, how do I spend $17,000 with no customers? And he he, he had to let go of seven of his servers finally. Uh, he kept it open for a year without paying, for, for, for paying himself. And then he closed it down and went bankrupt. And he owes $250,000. And that story can be told thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times in black communities all over this country. <laughs> These lockdowns were a war on the poor, and they were a war on American children. According to Brown University study, children in this country, toddlers lost 22 IQ points. The, uh, uh, a third of children are going to need, throughout their, their school careers, are going to need remedial education. Children all over the country have missed their milestones. What is CDC's response? Here's CDC's response. CDC, five months ago, revised its milestones. So that now a child no longer is expected to walk at one year. They, have, they walk at 18 months. And a child now does not have to have 50 words in 24 months. It's 30 months. So instead of fixing the problem, they are trying to cover it up. And... If you have the only indicia of social decline that it actually improved was that during the pandemic, child abuse dropped. It was just an artifact of data gathering. Why? Because child abuse is reported by the schools. And the schools were closed. And the, the kids were locked at home with their abusers. 55% of teenagers report being abused during the lockdowns. 
13% physically abused. It was also the schools were the places where people had hot lunches, where kids stayed at home watching screens or not, eating potato chips. We gained on average, average 29 pounds. And it was the, the, the obese, obesity killed you from COVID. We weren't made, this is the inverse of what you want to do if you want to say, these public health authorities went to every black neighborhood, locked down the basketball courts, so couldn't, people couldn't exercise. They, could, they had to get out of the sunlight. If they couldn't lock down the, the courts, they removed the basketball hoops. This was, you know, the, the, and, and all of us suffered from it, all the communities, but the black communities, the minority communities suffered the worst. Uh, uh, Twenty-five percent of teenagers reported going hungry. Uh, Twenty percent report uh, tried to commit su or had suicidal ideation. Nine percent tried to commit suicide. Suicide is now the largest cause of death among black children. Oh, these are just some some of the horrifying data, and I could go on and on, but I, I'm not going to. I want to talk about another issue, which is the close down of, the, of, our, our, of our rights. Not only did we start censoring people at the very, very beginning, and you know, ha Hamilton, Madison, Adams said we put freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all the other member amendment, all the other rights depend on that. If you give a government license to silence its critics, it now has license for any atrocity. So as soon as they, as soon as they knew, as soon as they knew they could censor us, as soon as they knew they could censor us, they then went after the other part of the First Amendment, uh, freedom of worship. They closed every church in this country without any scientific citation for a year, without any uh, uh, notice and comment rulemaking. Democracy was simply abolished. They then went after freedom of assembly. They told us we had to social distance. They went after our property rights, the Fifth Amendment. They closed 3.3 million businesses with no due process, no just compensation. They got rid of Seventh Amendment jury trials. They said, they said, they said if you're involved with a, with a countermeasure, no matter, how, no matter how egregious the injury you caused, no matter how negligent you were, no matter how reckless, you cannot be sued. And here's what the Seventh Amendment says. It says, no American shall be deprived the right of a trial before a jury of his peers in case there are controversies exceeding $25. Well, it does, there's no pandemic exception. And, and by the way, the framers knew all about pandemics because there were two epidemics during the Revolutionary War. One, there was an epidemic, a malaria epidemic in Virginia that decimated General Washington's truth. It was a smallpox epidemic that disabled the armies of New England at the very moment they conquered Quebec and they had to withdraw. Otherwise, today, Canada would be part of the United States. And, and, um, and by the way, we've had epidemic, but between the end of the revolution and the ratification of the Constitution in nine years, there were epidemics in every city that killed tens of thousands of people, cholera epidemics, smallpox epidemics, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, et cetera, malaria epidemics. They knew all about them, but they didn't put that in the, in the Constitution. The Constitution was built for hard times. It wasn't, it wasn't built for the easy time. It was built during the Civil War. There were 659,000 soldiers who died in the Civil War. That's the equivalent of 7,200,000 today. Our country was this close from falling apart. It was a much worse crisis than this pandemic. Yet when Lincoln tried to, uh, to, to prohibit, to ban habeas corpus, the court said, you, don't, you can't do that. You cannot do that. It doesn't matter how bad the crisis is, you cannot do it. It's the Constitution. It's the heart and soul of our country. Well, I did. President Trump said, well, these bureaucrats came at him from every side and they were all telling him he had to do it. He had the right instincts. He knew that he shouldn't have closed down the country. 
but he did it. He got rolled by his bureaucracy. And I, I'm going to tell you a quick story. During the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, the XCOM committee, which was all the intelligence officials and military officials, 11 of the 13 on there. My father was on there, and so was Bob McNamara. So those are the exceptions. But all of the, the doyens, the gurus, the, you know, the old gray men who were, you know, the Curtis LeMay and Louis Lemonser, the generals from the Joint Chiefs, they all said, we've got to go in and bomb the, the, the missile sites in Cuba, the 64 missile sites in Cuba. And my uncle said to him, well, wait a minute, what's going to happen? Who, who's on those gun crews? Are those Cubans or are those Russians? And they said, we don't know. And he said, well, if they're Russians and we kill Russians, it isn't Russia then going to have to go into Berlin? And they were like, well, we don't think they'll do that. And my uncle said, I want to see the aerial photographs. And he looked at the aerial photographs. And he said, who has, on, that, on the Cuban side, who, has, who gives permission to fire? Does it come from Russia? Does it come from Fidel? Does it come from the individual gun crews? Because if it comes from Fidel, he's going to fire them. If it comes from the individual gun crews, then you're putting the fate of the world in the hands of those commanders, 64 men. They didn't know. So he said, we're not doing it. And he did something else. And all I'm saying is, you need a president at this time in history who can stand up to his bureaucracy. <laughs> The bureaucrats, you know, the bureaucracies are owned by the industries. I'm talking about, you know, NIH and EPA and CDC and FDA and uh, the, the U and uh, DOT. A train track wreck would not have happened in East Palestine except we have a captive agency at DOT. Our food is terrible because the food companies and the pesticide companies own USDA. We're in constant wars because the military-industrial complex, the big contractors, own CIA. Now, I want to make this clear. I do not believe that everybody at CIA is a bad person. My, my daughter-in-law, Amaryllis, who is, is, who is one of the top officers on this campaign, spent her entire career as a clandestine agent or the CIA uh, as a spy in the weapons of mass destruction program in some of the most dangerous parts of the earth. And I have never met anybody with such courage. And that's how most of the 22,000 people at CIA are. They're people who are patriots, they're people who are good public servants, and they're people of enormous courage and idealism. And that's the same with most of our agencies. The problem is the people who end up rising in those agencies generally are people who are in the tank with industry. And, uh, and that's how they get corrupted. And you know, one of the things that I can do, I think, better than any other political candidate is I know how to fix them because I've spent so much time litigating and studying these agencies. Now, I, I want to talk about one last subject. But I, let me do two, two little subjects. <laughs> I very, I very, I very quickly, I want to just talk about the chronic disease epidemic. Because to me, arguably, this is the worst attack on the middle class in this country. We have the worst health care system in the United States of America. What do I mean by that? I mean that we spend more on health care by far than any other country, and we have the worst health outcomes. Uh, we have... We spend $4.3 trillion annually on health, $4.3 trillion. And about 84% of that goes to treating chronic disease. Now, why is that? Because America has the highest chronic disease burden in the world. And we didn't, we didn't always. In, in 1940s, 50s, and 60s, we had a really healthy population. We had only 6% of our people of our citizens or children had chronic disease. 
by 1988, that became 12.8%, so it doubled. Today, by 2006, it was 54%. We have the sickest generation in American history. We have the sickest children on earth in this country. And by chronic disease, what do I mean? I mean obesity, but more importantly, um, neurological diseases, neurodevelopmental, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette's syndrome, ASD, and autism. Autism went from one in every 10,000 people in my generation to one in every 34 kids today. Now, one of the talking points that the industry and their crooked legislators or regulators will say is, oh, well, we just started noticing it for the first time. <laughs> um, missing autism is like missing a train wreck, so it's an absurd, <laughs> but... <laughs> but more importantly, there is study after study after study that shows that this is not that this epidemic is real. It is not the result of changing diagnostic criteria. It is not the result of better recognition. It is an epidemic. And it's common sense because if it was changing diagnostic criteria, you'd see people my age with full-blown autism, 69 years old. I have never seen somebody my age with full-blown autism. I mean stimming, toe-walking, head-banging, non-verbal, non-toilet train. I, and I've been around at the spear tip of people with intellectual disabilities my whole life. My aunt founded Special Olympics. I worked in it from when I was a kid. My cousin, my, my dear cousin Anthony Shriver, is the founder of Best Bodies. This has been in the DNA of my family. I spent 200 hours working at Wasaic Home for the Retarded in the Hudson Valley when I was a teenager. Uh, I just didn't, I haven't seen it. Somebody my age who looks like that, and yet in my kids' class, schools, there are many, many children who, who look like that. And why aren't we asking the question, what happened? Yeah. Congress said... Yeah. Congress... And by the way, there's a report that came out a couple of weeks ago um, that shows that the cost of autism alone the American economy will be just of caring for people as, as this group now ages. It will be a trillion dollars a year by 2040. Oh, the uh, Congress said to EPA, tell us what year the autism epidemic began. And EPA is a captive agency, but it's captive by the oil, coal, and pesticide industry, not by pharma. So it actually came out with an honest study. And EPA said, it's a red line, 1989. Oh, something happened in 1989, and we know that it is an environmental insult, because genes don't cause epidemics. And the only thing is, we just have to figure out what it is. There's a limited number of cul culprits of, of chemical toxins that became ubiquitous around 1989. And, and so, you know, that's... That's something that NIH is a $42 billion budget. And by the way, it wasn't just those neurological disorders that started, and all these autoimmune diseases started. If you're my age, you never saw anybody with rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile diabetes when you were younger. You're, the allergic diseases, food allergies, peanut allergies, um, and eczema, Anaphylaxis, which now are ubiquitous, are 27% of our, our school budgets are now going to special education. This is crippling to the middle class in this country. And we need to figure out what it is. And I can tell you this. When I am the President of the United States, I am going to end the chronic disease epidemic in this country. And if I, if I have not significantly dropped the level of chronic disease in our children by the end of my first term, I do not want you to reelect me. Yes. 
Um, all right, I'm going to talk about one last subject, and it's a, but it's a big one, so settle down. Uh, I, I want to talk about the war in Ukraine. And we need to have a national conversation about this war. We need to have a mature... We need to have a mature conversation that allows for nuance and that allows for complexity, and we need to do it respectfully. We can't be telling one side that they're Nazis and the other side that they love Putin. Everybody in this country loves our country. And we have to respect differences of opinion and we have to respect the people's capacity to ask questions. And, um, you know, the, some of the issues that, that we need to talk about is, number one, is, th is this war in the U.S. national interest? We just need to isolate that question. Is it in the U.S. national interest? And there are, you know, some of the leading panjerums of uh, most respected people in, uh, um, in, you know, of our national diplomats, let's say, Henry Kissinger, Jack Matlock, Larry Wilkinson, who's you know, Colin Powell's chief of staff, they all have said definitively, if you just want to ask, is it in our national interest, it is not. It is not in America's national interest to push Russia closer to China. That is a cataclysm. Number two, it's not in our national interest to do something that could involve us in a nuclear exchange with a country that has more nuclear weapons than us. Now, having said that, I want to say that we are in the Ukraine for all the right reasons. We are there because we are a good people. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln said America is a great nation because we're a good nation. And we continue to be a good people. And we are there because of our compassion, the Ukrainian people who have been brutalized, who have been illegally invaded, and have shown extraordinary valor and courage defending their country and defending, you know, their families, and their beliefs and their liberties and their independence. Things that Americans have to admire. My own son, Connor, I'm very, very proud that Connor joined the Foreign Legion and fought in the Ukraine and during the Kharkiv Offensive as a machine gunner for a special forces group. Yes. And, But I think that we need to know as Americans, and we have a right to know, what is our government's chief objective in this war? Now, we were told initially that the objective was humanitarian. And that is a good reason to be there, a humanitarian. And what that means is trying to end the bloodshed and minimize it as much as possible. But in recent times, President Biden said that one of our objectives, at least, is regime change of Vladimir Putin. And this is the same strategy that did not work for, well for us in Iraq. And it's many of the same people who are around the neocons, who are around uh, uh, President Biden, who have been talking about that for a long time and have been engaged and uh, geopolitical machinations in the Ukraine since 2014. And then uh, President Biden's Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, validated President Biden's statement by saying that our objective in the Ukraine is to exhaust and degrade the Russian army so that they're incapable of having battles anywhere else in the world. Now, and indeed, 
many of the steps that we've taken in the Ukraine have seemed to indicate that our interest is in prolonging the war rather than shortening it. So if those are our objectives, to have regime change and exhaust the Russians, that is completely antithetical to a humanitarian mission. If it's... If, it, if we're there for a humanitarian mission, it means to reduce bloodshed and bring an end to the war quickly. If we're there to exhaust the Russians or regime change, then doesn't it mean that the Ukraine is just a pawn in a geopolitical battle between two great superpowers and that our strategy is to, is to put the flower of Ukrainian youth into an abattoir of death in order to exhaust Russia. And if that's true, then we need to know about it. If it's not true, then we need a pretty good discussion with the President and the Secretary of Defense and others to tell us exactly what are we doing there. And, uh, I want to talk just a little about some of the cause of the war. We've now committed $113 billion to the Ukraine for, for reference, the entire budget of EPA is 12 billion. The budget of CDC is 11 billion. We have 57% of Americans, we have a crisis here. We have a war on the poor. 57% of Americans cannot put their hand on $1,000 if they have an emergency. One quarter of Americans go to bed hungry. We have 1.5 million veterans who are living below the poverty line. We have 33,000 veterans who are homeless. We have 27 veterans, 23 veterans a day who are killing themselves. The war on the poor is a blood war. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, an old friend, Keith Amato. Can you stand? Yeah. And Keith is a commercial fisherman out of Provincetown and wealthy, um, and occasionally Shinnecock and I slip off the Long Island. Um, and we, we have a, uh, I'm, we've known each other for many, many years. We have a, a weekly ritual where Keith discovered years ago that at Whole Foods drops the price of oysters on Friday to $1. This is an ad for Whole Foods. So, to, for one dollar, he knows this because his son, his son-in-law, actually owns the Wellfleet Oyster Bed, where the oysters come from. So every Friday, Keith goes and picks up 30 oysters, um, brings them to my house, and I pay for the oysters. He shucks them. He makes the mignonette sauce, mignonette sauce, and we eat them. And I, uh, and we have an amazing friendship, and we're, and are very, very close. Uh, but Keith is on disability. That does not allow him to work anymore. And he has been surviving on food stamps. And his, on, on March 1st, he got a recorded telephone call from the government saying that his food stamps allocation is going to be dropped next month from $283 a month to $25. 30 million Americans got that phone call. 30 million Americans. The same month, the government announced that it is going to drop Medicare for up to 15 million Americans. The same month, the government announced that it is printing 300 billion extra dollars to pay off the Silicon Valley Bank to bail it out. And we announced, the Biden administration announced 750 additional millions of dollars that we're gonna to send to the Ukraine. 
So we have money for wars, and we have money for bail ba bankers that need bailouts. But what happens to the American people when they are on hard times? Shouldn't we have compassion for them? No. Oh. Okay, so let's look at some math. We're borrowing $6 billion a day, our government, to, to pay off the interest on our debt. $6 billion, we're borrowing it mainly from the Chinese and Japanese. In order to pay for the wars and the bailouts and the lockdowns, now the wars in Iraq and after its aftermath cost us $8 trillion. $8 trillion. We spent $16 trillion on the lockdown. That's $24 trillion. Does anybody wonder why we don't have a middle class in this country anymore? So we, how do we get this money? Well, we're borrowing it as fast as we can from the Japanese and the Chinese, which is not a good thing. But the other thing is we're just printing it. Between 1900 and 2008, we printed printed a trillion dollars. That was all of the money we printed in a century. Between 2008 and today, we've printed 10 trillion. 10 centuries worth of wealth to pay for bailouts and lockdowns. We're just printing money. And what happens to, what, how does that pay off? Through inflation. And inflation is a tax on the poor. Yeah. Oh, Keith, Keith had his, his Food stamp checks uh, dropped to $25, and you try going shopping on $25. Uh, you, you, uh, you have to be crazy to think that that is going to, sorry, you're going to survive a week on $25 a day. Oh, he's spending $25 on food. They got his food stamps to pay the inflation. His food bill has doubled over the past two years. And for basic food stuffs like chicken, dairy, and milk, it's gone up 78%. So we are starving American people, and we are cutting them off from the, from the kind of aid that we should be giving that we're instead spending on being the policemen of the world. We have 800 bases around the world now. We have... Uh, we spend $800 billion, $880 billion a year on our military. We were supposed to get a peace dividend. After the Soviet Union collapsed, we were supposed to go from $6 billion to $2 billion. That was a peace dividend. And then we were going to spend the rest, bring it home, and build schools and infrastructure. Instead, we've made up a bunch of foreign enemies and different enemies and things that we've got to do to spend more money. The military-industrial complex and the intelligence agencies are telling us we got... Instead of dropping it to two, we raised it to 8.8. So that's where we are. This is, this is what's happening. You know, if you go back to the beginning of our history, our founders made so many clear warnings against Americans getting involved in foreign wars because they said... Um, it is and it, it be, trying to be an imperium abroad is going to destroy democracy at home. It is going to turn us into a garrison state, a national security state, and a surveillance state. They said it's and it, the two are inconsistent. You cannot be an imperial nation abroad and a democracy at home. And. Um, my, uh, and John Quincy Adams really spoke for all of the framers when he said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. It is it's something we cannot afford to do in our country. My grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, said, well, we, should, we, we need to build fortress, fortress America. We need to arm ourselves to the teeth at home and, then, and make ourselves too expensive to conquer and then build our economy, because the economy is the source of strength, not bullets and weapons. It's having a strong economy, a strong middle class. Dwight Eisenhower warned against 
the military industrial complex and what it, that it would destroy democracy. My father died in his campaign against the Vietnam War. Uh, Martin Luther King broke with the civil rights movement on Vietnam and he said, this has got to be our priority because you don't, you're not seeing that there is a direct link between poverty at home and war, poverty and violence and oppression at home and war abroad. You cannot separate them. As long as we're making war, as long as our major exports are weapons and war, we will never have a middle class in this country. And my uncle, President Kennedy, said that, told his best friend Ben Bradley, he said, I, I, Bradley asked him, what do you want in your gravestone? What's your epithet? And he said he kept the peace. That's what he wanted. He said the principal job of every president of the United States was to keep our country out of war. And he succeeded in doing it. And he succeeded in doing that. And instead, he started investing in the Kennedy Milk Program, an alliance for pro progress, the um, USAID to rebuild the middle, to build middle classes in countries so that they could enjoy democracy. He started the Peace Corps because he said he wanted foreigners to know Americans not by you know military uniforms, but by people who came in their communities to help him. And you know, it's very, very difficult to to, to fairly judge. The, who the best presidents in our history were, you know, uh, historians take polls of each other, take polls of the public to try to figure out who's the best. But there is one objective merit, I mean metric, and that is, at least for foreign policy, which president has the most statues to him abroad, the most universities named after him, the most hospitals named after him, the most roads and boulevards and avenue, and nobody comes close to John F. Kennedy. Oh, and that, and that is a, if people love our country, that's good for our economy and it's good for our security. And that's what we had with my uncle. We had a, a we had a president who made it, well, my uncle used to say that he used to love the fact that there were Africans who were naming their children Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln, but they weren't naming them Marx and Lenin. He used to say that. But I think probably the proudest thing, if he could know of all the memorials to him, the one he'd be proudest of is the tens of thousands of African children. I've met many of them in my lifetime, and Latin American children, and Asian and Mideastern children who are named Kennedy. And I'm going to tell you this. You know, President Bush, my uncle came into office two months later, he was fighting his intelligence apparatus, his military, because they wanted to invade, uh, I mean, they wanted to go, do the Bay of Pigs. He was totally against it, and he let them roll over him. And in the middle of the Bay of Pigs, he realized they were lying to him, and he realized the function of the intelligence agencies had become to provide the military industrial complex with a constant pipeline of war. And he came out during the middle of the night during the Bay of Pigs catastrophe and he said, I want to take the CIA. Alan Dulles had lied to him, Charles Cabell, Richard Bissell, Louis Lemitzer, uh, uh, John, uh, Curtis LeMay had all lied to him through their teeth. And he said, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. <laughs> yeah. And you know, George Bush, George W. Bush had the same problem. And George W. Bush says the worst mistake he made as president was listening to CIA director George Tenet tell him it was a slam dunk that Saddam Hussein had uh, weapons of mass destruction. And so the neocons and CIA got to go into Iraq and throw out and do regime change. And, and we got not, now we've spent $8 trillion. And what do we get for that $8 trillion? Nothing. Worse than nothing. Iraq is now much worse off than it was when we went in there. They, we killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein ever did. We may have killed a million Iraqis, and nobody knows the number. It, it, is, it is an incoherent country today with, uh, where Sh uh, Shia death squads are fighting with Sunni death squads in the street. The government is corrupt. The police are corrupt. We created ISIS. 
We drove two million refugees up into Europe. They de destabilized democracy for a generation in Europe. They caused Brexit. This is the cost of the Iraq war. Eight trillion dollars there, 16 trillion for the lockdowns, 24 trillion, nothing to show except a devastated middle class in the United States of America, and we need to put an end to that. Uh, Uh, the, you know, our strategy in this country has been to use military weapons to project power, the military force to project power around the world. And that's how, you know, our strategy to control the world. The Chinese did something different. They adopted my uncle's philosophy and strategy, which is they, the eight trillion, well, we were spending eight trillion bombing bridges, ports, roads, and hospitals. They were spending a trillion building bridges, roads, ports, and hospitals. And they are now displacing us as trade partners of most of the African nations. Latin America, Brazil just switched the Chinese currency away from the dollar. Saudi Arabia just switched away from the dollar. So these are... Is that the... Okay, we're okay. I'm being told by Gavin De Becker that there is no emergency that affects us. All right, well, let me, I'm going to finish up. I'm going to finish up, I promise. I'm going to shut up in a minute. Um, so they, so the Chinese, so We've now lost, they, who, we love you, Bobby. Yes. Okay. Nice try. <laughs> oh. Oh. The Chinese, by being nice guys, have earn goodwill in these countries. Now, the Brazil and Pakistan are now switching to Chinese currency away from the dollar. You know what that's going to cost our country? If we no longer have the, the dominating uh, car, the universal currency, 750 billion a year. That's one of these costs of these continual wars that we have to examine. And so the Saudi Arabia had last month signed a peace deal with Iran, which is great. But Saudi Arabia was our biggest investment. They are our number one ally. The whole key to U.S. strategy was called the Shia Crescent. That Saudi Arabia would be the keystone, and then we'd have Abu Dhabi and Qatar and Oman and the Emirates and Lebanon all the way up to Syria on both sides, creating a bulwark against, uh, and Iraq, of course, creating a bulwark against uh, Iranian expansion, which was our key objective in the Mideast. Well, guess what? The Chinese just brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Our entire policy has collapsed. We no longer have a coherent foreign policy. And Iraq, I mean, they, um, Mohammed bin Salam said not only this, two weeks ago, he lowered oil production during a U.S. recession. It was like a, a, a slap in the United States' face. And then he said it out loud three days ago. We don't care what the United States thinks anymore. So we've put trillions and trillions of dollars into that, those nations 
with this strategy, the entire American empire just folded. Iran, Iraq, which we went to war of, is now a proxy state of Iran. Our entire strategy in the Mideast has utterly collapsed and our economy is going to follow if we don't do something fast. And I'm going to bring the troops home and I am going to start... I'm going to close the bases and I'm going to start investing in the United States middle class in our country and I'm going to make us an exemplary democracy again. I want to say one final, final thing, which is, and I'm going to put my cards on the table. I am not, I'm not an ideal presidential candidate for, for normal times. I, I'm not one of these people who've spent their life saying I've got to be really careful because one day I'm going to be in the White House. <laughs> I actually did the opposite of that. And I have led a very, very high risk life and a lot of fun, but I, uh, I, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't careful. And I mean, even the, the issues that I've attached myself to, um, anybody who looks at those issues will not say, oh, this guy is just trying to get into the White House. <laughs> I was trying to get myself out of all my friendships and uh, my political party and everything else. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I had a, I had a rambunctious youth, and it lasted until my early sixties. And I told my wife the other day, I said, I got so many skeletons in my closet that if they could vote, I could be king of the world. <laughs> uh, in normal circumstances, I would not do this. Uh, but these are not normal circumstances. I'm watching my country being stolen from me. And I don't. And I owe it to my children, to my family, and my legacy. I don't want you know, the Democratic Party to be the party of fear and pharma and war and censorship. We, we have to be more than just neocons with woke bobbleheads. We need, we need, you know, we need to stand up to corporations. We need to stand against war. We need to, um, we need to put our children first. We need to stop listening to the large corporation. In many ways, I, and, and that's what a Kennedy Democrat is. You know, we need to bring this party back to the party of FDR, of JFK, of RFK, of Martin Luther King, and, and those values. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I have spent my lifetime preparing for this office because I've spent so much time suing these, uh, uh, you know, these agencies. I know the agencies, I know, you know how NIH works, how CDC works, how FDA works, EPA. And Michael Baum, who's sitting here in the front row, is my law partner, who was one of the lead attorneys with, uh, with Brent Wisner on, the, you know, on our Monsanto case. Um, when we got the Monsanto papers, we realized that we found emails that showed that the head of the pesticide division at EPA was secretly working for Monsanto for forever. And, um, and, and that's true in all of these agencies. And most politicians, when they come in, um, they want to, you know, they sincerely want to fix the agencies. They want to fix the government. They want to drain the swamp. But they get in there and they don't, they don't know what to do with these sprawling bureaucracies, 30, 40,000 people in their own culture and their own history and people have been there forever and it's really hard for them to change that. So rather than do that, they concentrate on another agenda and they put somebody safe to run that agency. You know, uh, President uh, Trump brought uh, Scott Gottlieb in. He took a, President Trump took a million dollars from Pfizer and then appointed a guy who essentially was a Pfizer lobbyist. He was a business partner of Pfizer. 
run the agency, and then he, of course, made $88 billion for Pfizer on one vaccine, and then left to join Pfizer's board. That's not draining the swamp. That is the swamp. And, and you know, Pre President Biden is the same thing. I Look, I know Pete Buttigieg. I like Pete Buttigieg. He's a friend of my family. He's, I, my son uh, campaigned for him, was part of his campaign last time around. So, and I, you know, I, I like him, but I know, I can, I can tell you with an almost certainty that he did not go to DOT saying, you know, God oh, darn it, I'm going to fix the railroads and I'm going to end the corruption. Um, uh, most of these people go in because they're safe and they're going to be good on the talk shows on Sunday morning, but they don't really want to go in and they don't know how to, to go in and really make big changes in those agencies that can make waves and maybe cause problems with the president. So they get somebody safe. Ralph Reed used to describe those people. He said they were people who get the joke. And I, I, you know, I get the joke, but I don't think it's funny. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not safe. You know, I am not safe. For the vested interests, I'm not safe. My job is to keep you safe. And that's what I'm going to do. My dad, when, whenever we traveled, my father would take us to, um, in the Indian reservations, wherever we landed. We go, whether we were in Utah or New Mexico, go to um, Standing Rock or, or the uh, Navajo Reservation, or we go with, um, in upstate New York to the Mohawk Reservation, all around the country. He would always, when we got to the airport, he would want to go there. Um, and he'd take us there. He, he, he loved going to Appalachia. His favorite place in the world was Bed Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I was on the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration on the board for 20 years. Um, he would take us to Harlem. When we were kids, little kids, he would put us or to Appalachia, to the, the, to the white mining communities in Appalachia. He would put us in the back of a station wagon and he would drive us into southeast Washington. And we would go to the playgrounds there and talk to people. And my father would say to us, my father, when he came back one time from the Delta, he said, we were all at the dinner table when he came in, and he said, I was in a tar paper shack today. It was smaller than this dining room, and there were two families living there, and the, the children get one meal a day. And when you get older, I want you to help those people. And when we would go into southeast Washington or Appalachia, he would say to us, these are your people. These are Kennedy people. He said, the other people, the, the big shots, the corporations, the millionaires don't need the Kennedys. They have lobbyists. They have PR firms. They have lawyers. And he said, these are your people. And these are the people you need to spend your life helping. And when I'm president, I'm going to be president for those people. We're going to really take back this country. You give me a piece of ground and a sword, and I am going to take back this country with your help, the help of all the homeless Republicans and Democrats and independents who are Americans first. Thank you all very much.